Understanding the difference between searing, charring, and flat out burning your food is a very important fundamental lesson that all beginner cooks need to master. And I know it can be quite confusing. So in this video, I'm gonna go over each of them and try to explain what the differences are and give you some tips and tricks to help you sear better and avoid burning your meals. Let's dive in. Okay, so what exactly is searing? Well, I think a very simple definition that can help everyone kind of generally understand what searing actually is, it's when you cook the surface of something at high temperatures very quickly to cause browning or caramelization or commonly, it's pronounced many different ways, Maillard, Maillard, Maillard reaction. Basically, you're browning the surface, you're caramelizing the surface. And let me be very specific, searing is not exclusive to just steaks beef, right? You can sear chicken, you can sear lamb, pork, and so on. So searing is a very fundamental and crucial process of cooking. So that usually brings people to another question. What exactly is the difference between searing, charring, and just flat out burning your proteins? Charring is actually a bit different than searing. Charring happens when the surface of your protein completely breaks down and you're left with carbon. Now charring proteins is very common on the barbecue grill and it usually involves when your protein gets in direct contact with flames or other high temperature scenarios and I'm talking about exceeding 500 degrees Fahrenheit, well above 500 degrees Fahrenheit, which you should try to focus on is searing caramelizing that surface. Now the science is still out there, but charring breaks down very crucial molecules that can cause cancer. So when you do char proteins, it's not the best thing for your health. It's kind of a weird thing, but when it comes to meats, it's bad for you, but you can char vegetables. For example, charring asparagus in your pan or broccoli and you know giving it that light charred taste it's generally okay because it's not meat it's not flesh the molecules that are affected with meats is different than with vegetables and so forth so charring in a nutshell for proteins it's when you shoot the surface of the protein way past 500 degrees fahrenheit and usually it's on the grill open flames and so forth and that surface has just turned into black carbon Okay, so we talked about searing, which is browning or caramelizing the surface of your protein. And we just discussed charring, which is turning that surface into black carbon. So what's burning your protein? What exactly should you be looking for? Well, burning your protein is exceeding the surface and beyond way past 500 degrees. And you are not only blackening and turning that surface into carbon, but you're also turning the layers below. That black carbon is exceeding and turning into soot, and now you basically have a protein that's not edible. And really, if you have you know, burnt your protein, it's black, it caught on fire, you can tell it's beyond charred, you should throw it out. Don't eat it, you've now created basically soot, it's mixing with ash, there's a lot of carbon in there, it's not something you want to eat. So searing is a good thing, charring is not so great for proteins, and then burning something is beyond charring and really you want to avoid. So how do you know if you're searing, charring, or burning? What are the signs? Searing is a very distinct thing. You'll know if you're searing. The telltale signs are the surface of your protein is browning. You should get a nice dark browning, a rich color, and you should not be seeing a lot of smoke. I mean, you'll get some steam, and steam is different than smoking, right? So if you're getting a lot of smoke, black smoke is usually a big red flag that something's wrong. That's beyond searing. So you wanna look out for excessive amounts of smoke, especially if it's black smoke. And if something's not right, trust your instincts. If it smells weird, stop. And with searing, you really do have to trust your eyes and your ears. For example, we all know that if you put your protein in the pan and you don't hear that sizzle, you're not searing your pan's not hot enough. But likewise, if you put your protein in that pan, things are going ballistic, you're seeing a lot of splatter, the sizzle is very aggressive, you might even start seeing flames, things like that, that's you know signs of a grease fire, you're no longer searing, you have a fire on your hands, and you know, 
you should tame things a little bit. What you should be looking out for is a nice consistent sizzle. Trust your eyes, trust your ears. You shouldn't see anything too aggressive. You should be seeing some light smoking because the oil has its smoking point. You should be seeing some smoking there. And you should also be seeing some steam, some moisture. That's common. I mean, that's what searing is doing. You're removing the moisture, you're removing the water, and you're browning that surface. So that's typical, but you shouldn't see a lot of smoke. A lot of people will say that, hey, when I use my cast iron and I'm searing, my whole kitchen turns smoky and so forth. That's not good. Either A, you have very poor ventilation, or B, you are taking things to the extreme and you really don't have to. What about charring? Charring is usually associated with open flames. If you're seeing open flames, you're starting to see carbon being introduced, and that's usually a sign of charring. It's the same way with vegetables in a pan, right? If you're sauteing some vegetables, broccoli or whatever, and you're charring them, you'll see a little bit of smoke, right? That's what charring is. You're starting to see carbon. That's usually a sign of charring, and then burning is a lot of smoke. I'm talking about black smoke. It, there's a lot of soot. You have that burning smell, that distinct burning smell. Again, you gotta trust your nose. You gotta trust your senses, trust your eyes. Burning is burning. If your smoke detector's going off, something's wrong. There's a lot of carbon in the air. So searing in general, your spidey senses shouldn't be tingling. There shouldn't be any red flags. With charring, you'll smell a little bit of smoke. You'll see a little bit of smoke, but nothing too extreme. And usually it's associated with open flames. So think barbecue grills. Burning can happen on the barbecue in the pan. It can happen anywhere. Your smoke detector's going off. There's a lot of black smoke. There's a lot of carbon in the air. There's a flame, you know, things like that. Maybe even a grease fire. That's burning. If you're seeing thick smoke, something's wrong. There's something else that I want to briefly mention. Pan versus grilling or barbecuing. It's pretty much the same thing. Searing is searing. Whether you're on a pan or on a grill, your goal is to caramelize that surface, get that browning, that nice, deep, rich browning but the techniques are very different. If you guys are interested and you want me to make a future video, I'm more than happy to talk about searing on a grill. Things to look out for, what you should do, for example, how you should preheat your grill. Is it beneficial to have the lid open with open flames or the lid closed? How do I personally sear using a barbecue grill? Should you use a side sear zone? A lot of barbecue grills you know, have that and so forth. Today, I kind of want to focus on searing in general and generally speaking, searing in a kitchen with pans and so forth. So just a FYI. Okay, now let's talk about some myths regarding searing. There's a quite a bit out there. The first one that I want to talk about, and it's the most common one that's always discussed, is that searing locks in juices. And that's not true. Scientifically, it's been proven time and time again. I think it's Harold McGee that really dove in deep and actually showed that a seared piece of meat has less juices than one that was not seared. But there's a huge taste difference. I think what we're all looking for is that steak taste, that sear browning, that caramelization that's very, very distinct and we all love it. But searing meat doesn't actually lock in juices. It's actually impossible if you think about it. In order for that to happen, that protein would need to be seared on all sides, front and back and the walls at all angles at the exact same time in under 30 seconds. And that's impossible. I mean, think about it as like putting a meat in a chamber and closing in the chamber in all directions with very, very hot temperatures, making sure you do not modify those molecules, it's not gonna happen. And even if you did, there'd be some losses. You'd never have something that's perfect. So searing your protein doesn't actually lock in the juices. You can actually see that on the barbecue grill. As you're searing, you'll see the drippings and so forth. It's just not, it's impossible to do it. You'd have to do it at all angles. So that's the number one myth. What we're looking for though is that taste. A seared piece of meat, like steak, is way better than an unseared steak. So it's that caramelization that really makes things pop. Now there's a couple things you can do to minimize the loss of fluids and making your steak too dry. Obviously, temperature is important. Cooking it at the right temperature, I like medium rare for a steak, for example, and letting your steak rest. You want that steak to relax, right? And keep the juices within. 
Usually after you've cooked your steak, if you cut into it real quick, everything just explodes and you've lost all those juices. Let it rest, let it settle. That's a really important and crucial step. The next biggest myth is salting your protein or dry brining it, whatever you know you prefer to call it, helps you get a better sear. And that's not true. Salting the protein does two things. It allows the salt to completely penetrate through. So it's very common with thick pieces of meat. If you have a very thin piece of meat, you don't really need to salt brine it. And you should be seasoning both sides. So you should be good. But when you have a larger cut of meat, a thicker piece of steak or whatever, that salt needs time to penetrate the meat. So if you just salt it 10 minutes before grilling it or searing it or whatever, that salt's at the surface after the first couple of bites, you know, you've lost all flavor. So dry brining a thick cut of steak ahead of time and allowing the salt to penetrate could be anywhere from 30 minutes before to a couple of hours or even overnight can make a world of difference in flavor. But salt also does a very crucial thing. It draws out moisture. If you guys haven't already, check out my video on splatter. I gave you guys a very simple demonstration. It's used in culinary schools all over the world where you salt a piece of vegetable like squash or whatever before you throw it into the pan and if you don't pat it dry that moisture that comes up because of the salt that's being drawn out will cause a bunch of splatter. Salt definitely draws out moisture but just like with that example if you don't pat it dry and you just throw it in the pan you're doing two things. You're causing a lot of splatter and there's way too much moisture on the surface. And that's the opposite of what you want because that really hinders a good sear. And the last one I want to address, and there's more, but the last one I want to address is you have to sear at extreme temperatures in order to get a good sear. I've seen some wild things. I've seen people like literally catch their cast iron on fire and then sear with it. I don't know why they're doing that. I mean, I'm not saying those techniques don't work, but remember, Everything in cooking is a function of temperature and time. So technically, the greater the temperature, the less time you need to achieve what you're trying to achieve. But the less time you have to do something, the more spot on you need to be, or you're gonna have some problems, right? Searing actually can happen as low as 300 degrees Fahrenheit. I do not recommend it though. But the sweet spot is between 450, 475 to about 520. You don't need to go higher than that to get a good crust, a good surface, that caramelization that we're all looking for. Anything past that can be risky. If you have your own method and it works for you and you're going 600, 700 degrees Fahrenheit, great, but you don't need to. Okay, so how do you get a good sear? Well, here's some advice, some basics, some fundamentals. The first thing you have to do is make sure that the protein that you're gonna sear or cook is at room temperature or give it some time to adjust. Never take a steak out of the fridge when it's cold. Don't even think about taking a steak out of a freezer when it's frozen and trying to cook or even defrosting it in the microwave. That's just that's just gonna cause a lot of problems. But you need to start with a steak or a piece of meat that has had a chance to get closer to the room temperature. Otherwise, you have something that's really cold to begin with, you're not gonna cook evenly. It's also gonna give you a really hard time when you're trying to sear it. It's gonna be really difficult to sear it. You're just gonna have some problems. Likewise, moisture is your enemy when you're trying to sear. So pat your protein dry. That's the best thing you can do. Right before you're gonna throw it into the pan, pat it dry on all sides. Remove that surface moisture because that moisture is what's gonna kill the caramelization and it's gonna take longer to get that caramelization, which is gonna put your protein at risk for being overcooked. Likewise, if you're using a pan, preheat your pan, that's crucial. If you're starting off with a cold pan, you're kind of dead in water. Everything after that's just gonna be a mess. You're rolling down that hill and you're gonna get very frustrated. And likewise, use a high smoking point oil. Avocado oil is a great example with a 500 degree Fahrenheit smoking point. That's gonna give you the sweet spot for searing. Ghee has a very high smoking point. I think it's also 500 degrees or it might be slightly higher than avocado oil. It might be 520. I, I, don't remember, but for sure it's around that ballpark and it's a great alternative to searing as well. But you have to make sure you have a hot pan to begin with, followed by hot oil. Lay your protein away from you. You gotta make sure you do that. 
Otherwise, if you do have moisture or you made a mistake, that splatter is going to come right back at you. You do not want hot oil at 500 degrees Fahrenheit hitting you in the face. So that's a very important thing. And then you got to allow the protein to do its thing. Usually you'll see the meat naturally release. If you see that, you know you're on the right track. You should expect the good sear. Now, the rule of thumb is about two to three minutes per side. But again, it's a general rule. It all depends on the thickness of the cut and what you're cooking. It's absolutely okay to peak. You know, you can take a quick look, make sure things are okay, but try to leave the steak undisturbed. If you're not sure if the protein has released yet or not, just give the pan a little shake and it should release on its own. If it doesn't, give it a minute or two. A lot of smoke is usually a bad sign. A lot of grease splatters should tell you that there's still a lot of moisture in that pan. You should not be smelling any burning. There should not be any alarms being set off in your head. Trust your senses. Watch your temperatures. There's no reason to turn your burners on the highest possible settings. You should not be seeing flames. There should not be a grease fire. Remember, if you've preheated everything, you have the oil where it should be. Yes, you'll have a drop in temperature when you put the steak in, but keeping it at medium to medium high should be good enough. And that's if you have a gas stove top. So there's a lot of variables. You could have an induction stove top. Things can get really tricky, but that takes time and experience. You'll get the hang of it. Which brings me to probably the most important advice that I can give you. Practice makes perfect. Don't quit. Keep at it. After you've seared some steaks a couple of different times, move on to another category of meat, chicken. Play around with that, learn on that, move on to fish, pork, lamb, so forth. It just takes time, it just takes a little bit of patience, but practice makes perfect. I really hope this video was informative. Check out some of my other videos and I will catch you guys in the next one. Take care everybody.